thanks everyone for joining us today. This is the second half of our Scan to CAD series in which we'll cover how to approach organic shapes. So I am Ian Sayers. I'm the 3D scanning product manager with Hawkridge Systems. Previously in the series, we covered the more traditional side of reverse engineering, and we separated these installments into general modeling and organic or freeform modeling with the latter being the topic of today's focus. So this model here that we have on screen, this is what we call prismatic, basic, uh, maybe mechanical geometry. That is to say, it's made up of primarily simple shapes or primitive shapes, primitives like cylinders, planes, and cones. So I'm sure we have a lot of uh, SolidWorks users in the room today. And I'd wager that most of you wouldn't feel the least bit intimidated by having to model something like this. And in our previous installment, we showed you how to efficiently model these objects from scan data. Uh, but what about shapes like these? Would you be as comfortable tackling these? I think the average CAD user is gonna recognize these as difficult to model using traditional CAD packages, maybe even flatly impossible in many cases. So today we'll show you how we can deal with these shapes from a reverse engineering and a design aspect. And we'll summarize some of the surfacing techniques we touched on in the last installment, and then we'll progress on to something totally different that our average CAD user is probably not familiar with. Uh, to that end, we have Gregory George and Matt Fisher with us today. They're both application engineering managers who specialize in 3D scanning applications, and they're going to show us some of the tools and techniques at our disposal to approach some of these challenging forms. We want to answer as many of your questions as possible while on topic, so please go ahead and just ask those questions as many as you want throughout the event, and we'll answer them as we go, and stick around for more questions afterwards. So just type those questions right into the question pane in your GoToWebinar interface as they pop into your heads. So let's dive right in, and I'm going to hand it off to Hawkridge's own Matt Fisher. Hello, everybody. Um, as Ian mentioned, I'm an application engineer at Hawkridge Systems, and um, I wanted to start off my section of the webinar just talking a little bit about where we ended last time, this introduction to hybrid modeling and what is it. Um, traditionally, what, you know, as Ian mentioned, with prismatic modeling, we're using kind of exact fittings and um, dimensions and sizings. But what happens when you have something like um, this block on the top corner, where you have something that is pretty manufacturable, it's got exact edges, but maybe with like some kind of tooling that needs some kind of, that was hand carved that it has to fit to. Or something like this brake lever that's on the bottom corner, where it's um, all free form actually. It's all this kind of topology redesigned um, for maximum amount of strength to lowest amount of material. But because of that, we lose a lot of those prismatic corners. Um, so we have to add them back in. This is the idea of hybrid modeling, is kind of combining both free hand shape modeling um, approaches and extractions of surfaces um, with the prismatic side of it. So in the case of the brake lever, um, we've just basically turned it into a solid body, and then we've added in a prismatic cut afterwards. Same thing, or in, in kind of the opposite approach with this block at the top corner, where we have taken something that was all modeled properly, and then we just extracted maybe a free, free form surface, and replaced one of the faces on this prismatic block with this freeform surface. Um, so now we have this kind of combined um, aspect to it. This is just one approach of hybrid modeling. There's actually a couple different approaches. Another one is this one, where it's um, you're using something like auto surface to just take a section that is just un unmodelable. Like Ian said, there's just some things that just you you are near impossible to recreate, like this kind of statue top. So instead, what we're doing is we're going to take the statue top and use something like auto surface where we're doing a one-to-one -one conversion of the scan data and converting it into a solid body. And then we're gonna take the bottom part of the statue, so this design base, and then combine them together, kind of creating this freeform hybrid model design mixture. And where they intersect um, at the base of the, or at the top of the design base, um, as you can see, they kind of mold together very well. Um, and this is the benefit of being able to just take something that's just, I don't need to model this, I'm gonna spend way too much time modeling the statue, I just need it to turn into a solid so it's something CNC-able or 3D printable and combine it to my design base. And now we have these Boolean operations available. Um, and the reason why it's kind of also nice to have this form of auto surface is because if you've ever worked with a mesh body, especially inside of something like SolidWorks, so a mesh body in SolidWorks, you tend to find that mesh bodies and solid bodies don't really interact. 
from 2020. They have made improvements to that, um, but you know, it's nice to have that solid body um, to work with ahead of time. So again, this hybrid modeling approach, taking that organic stuff, turning it into a solid, is it much easier to interact with other solid bodies. To kind of build off of this even further, um, just a, like kind of like a recount, uh, prismatic modeling is the exact dimensioning. So uh, the demo blocks, uh, this, this block's top side um, with these exact cuts and holes, this is a prismatic modeling approach because we have exact dimensions that we're using to create these cuts. And then we have the freeform modeling, which is something that's just near impossible to model with any form of um, prismatic approach. Maybe we can do a bunch of spline lines and a bunch of spline fittings, but overall not going to be the greatest model if you can have something like freeform, which is being able to just carve out sections and fittings. And then we have the modeling hybrid approach, which is something that, you know, like this pelvis model where it's super organic, super impossible to model, maybe all that bone, but we need to have these exact fittings into it. So we're going to just create the solid body um, from the scan itself. And then we're going to add in the cuts afterwards to get our fittings exactly where we want them to be. Um, so yes, kind of just to, to recap then um, the last little bit is there's these three different approaches to modeling. Hybrid modeling is kind of the approach of being able to take the, the free form side of things that we just can't model and we want to turn into a solid body and then adding in the prismatic features afterwards. So not only can we do this with solid bodies, but we can do this with surfaces as well. Um, so surface detail is actually another whole aspect of reverse engineering. You know, sometimes we need to just extract, like I said, a specific face. Um, we need it to be exact because we're going to replace a different face with it. Or um, in the case of something like this PlayStation 4 controller, uh, we can create the surface and then thicken it. And now we have something that we can 3D print. Surface fitting is often significantly um, more accurate than any other kind of form of modeling by hand. The reason why is because you're fitting these surfaces to the mesh itself um, in a lot of cases. So we can, as we can see from this kind of deviation analysis report, the, the controller's shell is extremely accurate. Um, it's all green uh, compared to that histogram, but this can kind of be a double-edged sword. And the reason why is we have situations like this bottom side um, where it's uh, the top part of this uh, fitting. And as you can see, it's not the best shaped holes. We have little bumps and grooves and even the epoxy is showing with all these bumps and grooves. And if we were to surface extract this, you know, just like I did with the PlayStation controller, it is all accurate, but the problem is, is it's accurate to the point where it's picking up these bumps and grooves. So what we want to do is kind of delete away the parts that we don't want um, using, you know, this hybrid modeling approach of inserting in bodies and deleting them away. In the case of this PlayStation controller, um, it was actually a lot of surfaces and then it had a bunch of bumps and grooves that, you know, where the buttons were. And I deleted those out, so now it's just left with the only sections that I want. Kind of show this off a little bit more. So I have the, the entire kind of the step-by-step -step workflow right here. Um, so at the very top corner, we have the direct auto surface section. So what I extracted right from um, the mesh itself. Um, and the next part of it was actually inserting in those, uh, or modeling up those inserts to bring on or to put onto the surface. So I've outlined a lot of the buttons and I even found ways to get a plane to my perspective. And then I projected a surface onto that kind of trim up the edges because you can see the edges aren't perfect either. And, you know, because of this, I have these inserted bodies um, with the exact dimensions that I need. I can just do Boolean operations to cut them away from my surface. So now I have, you know, just the, the section of that controller that I really want. And now I can bring this in and like I said, I can thicken it or I can use it as a reference for another body. Um, kind of like with that one block where we had those one bumps and grooves. Well, I can use like something like the surface to now cut away from my solid body or replace a face on the solid body um, to create that organic shape um, if needed. But, you know, this sounds great and all, but there actually are kind of limitations. We can't do everything with a hybrid model approach. Um, so, for example, with that kind of uh, hand cast uh, that was shown previously with the freeform, you know, how do you kind of go about that? You're going to have little bumps and grooves that you still might not be able to fix with just prismatic modeling. But we can get a lot of the way there. And I want to show that off a little bit. And I'm going to pull up um, inside of DesignX. I have this brace right here. And, you know, I showed previously just being able to cut away a part of it. But how about, you know, where are we going to reach these limitations? What are the points where we can say, all right, we've kind of reached the end of hybrid modeling. We now need to kind of go into the free form. Well, with this, you know, brace right here, I can go through and run the auto surface. So I'm going to take this mesh and I'm going to turn it into a solid body. Um, so I have something to kind of work off of. So over here, I'm going to just click organic and I can click the next stage arrow um, so I can see a preview of what my, my uh, surfaces will look like. 
just to kind of recount in case you aren't aware of what Autosurface is doing, um, it is essentially laying out a series of spline lines across the mesh, which we'll see pop up in a moment. And these spline lines are gonna create a bunch of intersection points and create a bunch of essentially mini surfaces. These mini surfaces are then stitched together. And you know, just like in SOLIDWORKS, if we stitch together a bunch of um, surfaces, we're gonna create a solid body. So you know, here are kind of the preview of where our surfaces will be. If everything looks good, I can just click okay. It's gonna go through and I'll finish that. But again, I'm just taking parts that I just, I won't be able to model. So I can't model a lot of these webbings. They're very freehand and they've been optimized by a computer, something uh, to, to get the maximum amount of detail that or strength that we can. So I just want to turn it into the solid body so then I can insert in those fittings afterwards. So let's give it one more moment. There we go. If I had my mesh, here's my solid body. Just to kind of show off the accuracy, we have a deviation analysis and you know I can hover over and I mean, at this point I have zero millimeter difference between the, the scan and the solid body, so it's super accurate. At this point, we can continue on with the hybrid model approach of being able to create something like a mesh sketch. So I can reference the copied mesh and move this over a little bit. So now what I'm doing here is creating um, a preview of where my plane intersected with the mesh. I can select on one of these edges to extract out a circle. So now I have something that's a proper size. Here I go, just kind of extruding this out a little bit more. I can extrude this out and I'm making essentially this cut feature now. So I'm cutting away the part that I want to be exact. You know, maybe this is, you know, needing to fit a, a type of thread through here or, or a bolt through this. So if I need to make sure it's a certain size, that's no problem. I can always just edit my sketch again, add a dimension and change this to whatever need be. And once I exit out, it's going to keep that size. And here we go. We have our freeform shape with a prismatic cut into it. We'll take it a little bit further, you know, maybe I need to add in another little circle, that's no problem. Here I am just going in and inserting a cylinder that references the mesh. This is something like region grouping inside of DesignX where it's it recognized where a cylinder might be and it's gonna extract out a cylinder to match exactly to that. I can edit this out even further. Maybe I need to extrude this out more. These are all editable sketches. And now I can change the cylinder to a cut. And there we go. If I hide my mesh again, we have another prismatic cut into it, extracted from the mesh itself. So if it does happen to need that an angle, it doesn't need to be the exact. Um, it's actually intended to have something at an angle where we can extract it up that way. And you know, this is kind of at the point where we were we said, you know, we, we've added in these prismatic cuts and features um, into this organic shape, you know, but where are these limitations that you might have been talking about? Well, if I look at something like this corner right here, or these these parts right here, you know, we have this extremely nice blend between them because it's been optimized in a way like this. This is, you know, the freehand organic um, molding between the two. But because this was scanned. Um, and it was 3D printed and maybe it might have had some wear and tear to it, it's been dropped a few times. We have little bumps like this, um, like these kind of corners right here. And if I actually change um, the way it's displayed, it might come out a little bit easier for you to see. So what about situations like this where we have, we, we don't want these kind of bumps, we need something exact. Well, you know, we can approach the same way we have been doing. So I can uh, create a new mesh sketch, referencing my mesh again, because I want to make sure I have it exactly in the right spot. So here I go, I'm gonna add that in. I'm gonna add in this circle. Maybe I can make it out a little bit bigger, uh, change it up just a tiny bit. And I am actually gonna make it just a tiny bit bigger than this because I want to make sure it is completely encapsulated on um, this, this improper section of it. And I go over to my extrude again. I'm just gonna merge these together. This is direction, again, just creating this new little fitting. I'm gonna click okay. And these have been merged together, so that's perfect. You know, it's it's combined, it's a single solid body. Again, we can 3D print this, um, it'll be uh, come out really well. But, you know, we have issues like this corner right here. And this is really where we're gonna start reaching our limits. If you ever have worked with um, kind of like a, a, any body that has something organic, merging with something prismatic, 
you have sharp edges and um, you know spiky points that might be where a lot of stress is applied upon. So yes, we could add our prismatic cuts into here, but you know we don't have something optimized in a way to transfer all the energy or any kind of stress that might be put on this spot to the rest of the body. And we could add fillets, sure, but you know if I try to add a fillet, even at something at 0 0.025 millimeter, it's still not able to detect it because it's just maybe too sharp of a corner, like in right here, um, so on and so on. So there's not really a way to meld this new prismatic section to our already freeform shapes. And this is kind of where we want to move more into the freeform realm the, in something like geometric freeform because it has abilities to sculpt these together. Um, so if I exit out of here, again, I can't add any fillets, but if we were to move it into something like geometric freeform, um, we have things like hot wax tools and we can uh, create that kind of meld together. Um, so at this point, I want to hand it over to uh, Greg. Uh, he can show up a lot of freeform and he can go over just how we can go about making something like this prismatic fitting into the freeform shape. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Can't wait to see what George has to say. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, so this is Geomagic Freeform, as we were talking about before. Um, and picking up uh, where Matt left off, uh, Freeform really is, the way I like to describe this product, is kind of like a Swiss Army knife 3D modeling tool, right? And that's kind of a vague explanation here. But really, it's a collection of a lot of different tools. Um, that you really can't find in many other places in the market, right? And the main intent uh, for all those tools is to actually create an object, right? So yes, it's a sculpting tool. Yes, it has CAD tools. and But where it differs from almost every other product in the market is the fact that we want to make this. We want to uh, take this data and actually go create something, not just make an animation or or create visualize, visualizations of different shapes, right? So Freeform also, another distinctive difference here is it's a multi-representational modeler, right? So today, what I'm about to show here is how we can modify the shape and blend these two objects together. But right on the surface, you see some things that are different colors, right? Um, so this uh, purple shape is actually a polygon mesh. Um, and what we did is Matt gave me that piece where he removed the cylinders from it. And we want to cause, we want to go ahead and intersect this model with those cylinders and create a nice clean blend and maybe modify this shape as well. Now the gray objects, those are actually CAD bodies, right? So this, this is why I say it's like a multi-representational modeler is, you know, I have a CAD and polygons in the same workspace which some softwares in the market do. But then there's a whole other idea of voxel-based modeling as well. It's, a, it's actually one of the primary modes of accomplishing a lot of the tasks that we're gonna uh, talk about today. So not only can you work with CAD objects, you can work with mesh objects. We can model with voxels, which are volumetric pixels or cubes, right? And we can sculpt and model with those. And then later on at the end of today's uh, presentation, I'll show that it can also model with subdivisional surfaces in the same workspace. Now, the idea is not to silo model in these individual uh, workspaces, but uh, model with them together in one space, utilizing the strengths of a mesh with the strengths of a CAD object, with the strengths of a subdivisional surface, um, and utilize them together um, to create deliverables, as you'll see here in a minute. So that's a, a, a brief explanation of what Freeform is. So now I'll show some of the tools and how they work. But before I do that, one other component that I want to expose here is the fact that I have a haptic device on my desk. Um, so Freeform, not only is it a software product, but there's also a hardware component to this product as well. So in today's presentation, I'm using this device sitting on my desk, and it is a haptic uh, device. What that means is essentially a 3D mouse, but where a 3D mouse leaves off is you can move a, uh, a part in 3D around in space and rotate it. And with this product, 
it also has a sense of touch where I can actually take that stylus and touch the surface of the solid polygon voxel object, no matter what it is, I can actually feel the surface of that uh, part. And that tactile input is actually critical to using Freeform. Yes, uh, uh, a lot of the tools work with a mouse only where I can open up parts and export and do all kinds of different things with a mouse only, but where another differentiator here is the fact that I have this haptic device. So it's a little small on screen right now, but I'll make the stylus a little bigger. I actually grabbing this haptic stylus and moving it around. Now I actually have a sculpting tool um, that I can use, uh, but if I just hold a shortcut, I can actually grab the part itself and move it around with that haptic stylus too. So this device can be used like a 3D mouse, like I, were ta I was talking about before, but it also is used for a lot of these sculpting operations that I'm gonna perform um, along the way. So again, that's a brief overview. Freeform is a software product, has a haptic component to it, a multi-representational modeler, and I'll kind of just show you some of the strengths of having these tools at your fingertips. So one thing, I'll just move my, uh, Go to meeting uh, dialogue out of the way before I get started. So, with this object, with the hybrid workflow, the modifications that you make to it are going to be very prismatic or CAD based. So, you saw Matt poke a hole through here or remodel an area by overlapping a solid with another one. But what if you needed to make more elaborate uh, modifications to this, where maybe you needed to move these cylinders around? Right? Maybe I maybe I modeled these cylinders uh, a half an inch farther in this X direction, and now none of these forks come down and join with that. Now, in a hybrid workflow, you're really not going to be able to make many of those modifications. So this is where uh, the freeform comes in handy. So you'll notice that I have this mesh object here. Purple objects are mesh objects. If I want to go ahead and uh, convert this object to a voxel object. I just come over to Mesh Utilities and I say I want to copy this object to clay. Um, so what you're doing here, and you'll notice that the preview turns to like the skin tone color, which is representation of uh, voxel objects or what the software calls clay objects. Now when you do this, you're actually taking that mesh shell and filling it with voxels and you can dictate a resolution of how fine you want those uh, voxels to be when you fill them, right? Um, so what you can do is you can say, I want to add detail. I can actually plug in an actual value here uh, of how fine of a grain of sand, essentially, that you're going to pour inside of this object. Now, once you've selected that, you hit apply, and then the software seamlessly converts that over to a, a voxel shelled object. Now. Um, if I ever want to change that resolution, I can always just hit a shortcut here. We have a, a, a spacebar toolbar, and I can come over to clay coarseness, and I can tell the software, hey, I want to just move this to a fine voxel. And then it will retopologize that shape with a finer grain of uh, a sand, essentially, that it fills inside of it. So this is a volumetric shape. And what I say, uh, when I say that, if I just take the stylus here, this is sculpting stylus, and I touch, again, I can feel the surface of this part, and I just push. You notice that when I poke a hole through it, it always has a bounded shape to it. So if I even shrink this down and just bore a hole through, um, you can see that I just poked a hole through it. It's always volumetric, so I can't really create this zero thickness surface in here with voxels. I always have a solid shape, just like it's matter, like I'm actually touching a piece of clay, and this is how it would respond when I touch it with a sculpting tool like this. So you got all kinds of tools like this where I can just carve things away if I wanted to, if I wanted to apply texture or, or, or create holes through it. Um, here, just hit undo too many times there. Um, so if I want to blend these two shapes, you, you'll notice that there is a, uh, of space between those two objects here. Here, just a second. Let's just zoom in. And while you're doing that, we have a question from the audience. 
is this voxel smoothing different than smoothing a mesh? And I think I could say yes, because you're basically removing the math from it, which is, is some of the power of freeform. You're just adding and removing particles. What do you have to say about that, uh, Greg? Absolutely, it is a little different than mesh smoothing for sure, because yes, uh, if, if essentially I take a polygon object, I fill it with a larger cube, um, the smoothing around the edges is going to be a little bit different than smoothing on a mesh. I will say that when you look at the object on screen, uh, the way any object is visualized in 3D on screen, even CAD objects, is using polygons to display what's there. So essentially what you visualize is a polygon wrapped around the voxels on here. And we can, we can actually leverage both of those and smooth the mesh or smooth the voxel to apply smoothing. And we'll get into some of that here in a second, actually. Um, and I just add that, um, I mean, you can, there are definitely tools that smooth meshes and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's not always an ideal scenario because, you know, meshes are just complicated. They involve more math and bad things can happen. You get a lot of self intersecting triangles and highly creased edges and stuff that don't result in, um, in workable or 3D printable models. That's a great point to to make about voxel smoothing is you are not going to create any twisted or self intersecting polygons. So a polygon object in some ways isn't as smart as a voxel object to where you can have these things that are impossible to print or impossible to create because they self intersect where with voxels it's always a solid all the time. So that is a great point to make. So we'll get to smoothing in a second as far as how I can smooth, but I'll talk about a couple of the tools here that are really powerful. One of them is this ability to tug right on the voxel object like it's clay. Um, so I have this zone here and you'll notice it has a, a vertex in the middle. That's my focus point. I can actually just click and pull on this just like it's clay. And it actually has resistance with the voxel, uh, uh, with the haptic. So when I click and pull, I, if I wanted to blend this into the solid, you'll see that I can just grab this shape and manipulate it and pull it directly inside of the CAD body. And you just see how you can blend that shape down there. And this goes for the whole the whole part too. So I'm only blending this small area, but if I wanted to grab like very large areas, this this haptic, uh, this tug tool works on very large areas as well. So you see that I just pulled that down and blended it. But if I wanted to expand this way out and grab and pull this, you can almost use it as a variable scale uh, type tool where I can just grab and scale an area or pull it only in one direction. If I wanted to grab this and just move it, I can do that and just pull it in one direction only, right? Another thing like we talked about uh, smoothing is this hot wax tool is really interesting. Um, so if I have this object and it has a lot of ripples and, and Sometimes when these objects are created, sometimes they use software that uses math uh, to simulate and create the shape, right? And it has a lot of rough areas. So you can come in with this tool called the hot wax. So a lot of sculpt sculptors use wax to sculpt in and they'll use a torch to kind of melt and smooth. And that's what this tool kind of simulates. It's like taking the clay and relaxing and I'll just, uh, exaggerate this a lot so you can see you can smooth you can smooth add smooth remove so check this out if i add smooth smooth remove and just keep pushing down into the shape you can see if i hold it i can just keep melting all the way through it if i wanted to so where this is helpful is maybe there's an area we need to add a little material to so i can come over and say smooth add and I can just go along this ridge here and just add material in that area and just strengthen it and make maybe make the whole area more curvature continuous if I want to. 
So you can see all these types of modifications that you can make to the surface. Um, and then, you know, you got your tug, you got your smooth with hot wax, but what if I want to mask off an area and smooth it? We'll just maybe find another area here. Um, you have the ability to kind of mask off a region where you can paint with this paintbrush and say, I want to smooth that area. And you can adjust your smoothing sliders here and then even how it feathers the transition into other areas and you can hit smooth. And you know what? Actually, a good area to do this on is like an edge. You can kind of see a little better here. So if I take this area and I go around it with my haptic, again, I can feel it. So I'm able to select all the way around because I can feel it with the haptic. And I come over and I hit smooth, smooth, smooth. You can see how you can modify that. It also allows you, in built in this tool, it to repair areas. So if I had a, a defect, this happens a lot again. Maybe there's a defect right there on the surface of that part. Obviously the tug tool will help me repair that defect, but I can come over with the smooth area and I can click that area and we have this D feature tool. So whatever is in there, it almost does like a hole fill. It'll just erase it. So you can come around to the entire part and smooth areas and work with them. Um, so I'm not going to go blend every single area in here because I have a certain amount of time that we are going to work with today and I have two other workflows that I really want to show. But the idea here is I've, took, I've taken this voxel object and the CAD object here and I've blended just that area. I would obviously go around and blend more areas. What if I want to merge those together to create one object? So the cylinder number five should be that one. So I can select that cylinder number five and I can say combine into, I'm going to combine that into this brace crop clay, this object right here, and then hit, hit OK. And then turn all my cylinders off. So you can see now what it did is it converted that solid to a voxel shape and merged it with the, uh, the voxel shape that I already had. So you can, again, use some of the tools that we've even already talked about, where I can come around, and if I want to make this blend a little more smooth, I'm going all the way around. You'll see I went all the way around with my haptic. I could feel it as I went all the way around. Select and mask off that area, and I can tell it to smooth and blend that in, and then get out of it. Now, if I was going to go print this right now, like if I wanted to go just send this to a printer, this is actually ready to go. I can click here on the shape and I can go to my clay utilities and say copy to mesh and then save that out as a mesh object and go print that right now. Now, if I wanted to take these changes that I've made and convert them into a CAD surface, that same auto surface command that we have in our design egg product is available here too. So I can go auto surface that shape that I've made changes to directly in here. Or if I had Design X, I could always bring in the mesh over there and auto surface it in that product as well. It just depends on you know how you want to go about doing it. We have another um, question here. Um, someone says, I, I see that you converted multiple different types of bodies to clay. Would this be a good tool for consolidating models from many different formats or sources? Uh, yeah, and one benefit there is when you do consolidate, depending on which direction you're going, um, you're able to work with all of them in one space. So yeah, uh, this is usually, this is a space where a lot of model technologies come in to one area to work and interact with each other and then go get sent out for a final deliverable, whether it's manufacturing in a traditional sense with subtractive methods or additive methods like we at 3D Systems uh, do as well. Um, so yes, this is a great space for consolidating a lot of different design processes into one area. And then you can output it as needed, depending on what you're trying to do. So now I'll go ahead and transition over to another workflow. Um, this one is what we call like an OMP workflow. 
Um, this is a piece of anatomy that we were given that was captured with a scan. And um, I'm going to go ahead and create a brace uh, for this, like like the images on the initial PowerPoint. Now, yes, in theory, you could take this type of shape and auto surface it and try to work with it inside of CAD. Um, but Freeform can do this 10 times faster than you would be able to do that inside of a CAD type environment. And you'll see why here in a second. So again, this is a polygon scan. And I'm gonna say that I wanna make a brace that goes around the wrist and encapsulate this area and hold the arm in a certain position. And remember, as we talked about before, this is a mesh. In order to use a lot of the sculpting tools, we have to convert it over into a uh, voxel object, which is a seamless process. So I can say convert over to voxels and I can select how much detail that I want it to have and I can hit apply. Um, so right out of the gate, when you scan somebody's anatomy, you try to keep them, you want them to hold their, their anatomy in a certain position, but sometimes, you know, maybe the wrist isn't quite at the angle that we wanted it to be um, to do what we're trying to do here, right? So if you need to modify the angle of that wrist, um, I don't really know of any other way to do it in the scan mode besides have them hold their anatomy in a different location and rescan it, right? Um, but we actually created a really interesting tool called Bend and Twist. So with the Bend and Twist tool, I use my haptic and I have this virtual plane floating around in space and I have the haptic and I'm just moving it around. I can take that and just touch the voxel object wherever I want it to be and I can create this envelope. And with this envelope, I can organize it and manipulate it to encapsulate the area that I want to work on. So this is essentially the area that is going to do the bending. So I'm establishing what I want to bend and what I want to be influenced by that bend. Once I set up the envelope, I can just toggle over to the bend and twist mode here. And anything that is that green color, and you can adjust the directions and everything of all this, is going to actually be bent. And you have these two different handles here. Um, this one over here, and then this twist over here. You can adjust them with values down here in the dock. But in order to see it, I'll just switch sideways here. You can grab that handle and move it and manipulate it. Now, obviously, since this is a 3D model, I can create geometry that really would never exist, right? Um, so you gotta be real careful with how far you go with the actual bending and even the twisting here too. You know, twisting it too far so it's not natural. But the idea here is I usually, usually use it in these applications for very basic corrections. So if I just need to tweak the position of that anatomy just by a few degrees, and once I get it, I can hit apply and it will bake in those changes. And I'll just get out of the command. So you can see that I only changed it by a few degrees because maybe I need to straighten it out just a little bit. And again, you can adjust all of the settings there um, to tweak in, and uh, tweak how far and how much it moves. Now, if we want to create a brace, the next step is to go ahead and offset the anatomy itself and Boolean that with the, the anatomy and then use that to create a brace, right? Um, we've done an awful lot of this in the market. So what we've done is we've created a tool that kind of does it all in one step. Um, so if I come over here and I just look at the arm in this direction, and I'll just look at it in the direction that I want to create a sketch, I'll create a plane from this perspective and I'll just say uh, flat to my view and then I can sketch directly on it. So you can see that we have a lot of CAD-like tools built right in here. Um, and with this tool, I'll just come in and I'm just gonna draw where I want this brace to bisect the shape of the anatomy here. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. And again, I can come in and I can sketch 
2D lines, I can do trimming. So you can see I can trim those shapes together. So I just created that shape. And really what I'm doing is I'm just creating an area that I want to intersect with the anatomy to create a brace. And you'll see here in a second how that works. So I'm gonna use the shell cut clay tool. And the way I like to describe the shell cut clay tool is it essentially is like the brace tool. It's going to extrude that shape. Um, it'll offset the model. It'll Boolean those together and it'll Boolean the anatomy from the middle. And it does that all by a couple values. So I use the sketch, I hit next, I select how thick I want it to be, how much buffer space I want between the two shapes. I'll create it as a new object with a 0.5 and then hit apply. So it'll take a second to calculate again. <laughs> So again, what it's gonna do is offset that shape and then create a uh, shell for me. And then I'll go ahead and split this into two, two bodies from there. Um, so you can see it finished the brace. Um, uh, so as you look at it, I'll just highlight what happened here. Um, so if I turn off the arm anatomy, you'll see that it created that shape, a hollow shell. And again, this is where I was talking about where it is a little bit of a graphic intensive tool, which is why I'm struggling to run that inside of a, a go-to meeting. Um, but it does all of that work for you. And usually when you're not in a meeting, it only takes seconds to run to create this type of shape. Um, so you can see that I'm like most of the way there creating a brace. Um, my issue now is that it's very difficult. You wouldn't be able to get your hand in there, right? Um, so what I like to also show is the ability to create uh, a split joint. So there's a whole host of ways of doing it. Uh, but one way that I uh, have done it in the uh, past here is using a surface to split this shape. Now this surface I created manually using my haptic in space. So this is something, I'll turn my surface off for a second. I won't recreate the whole thing. Um, but with the haptic, this is another really interesting benefit that you have. I have the ability to take this haptic in, in 3D space and you can turn on different windows. So you can see from the side view where I'm looking here, I can see the depth of where I'm drawing in space and I can push back and forth here. I can actually just come in and just draw 3D curves. These are like CAD curves, splines in 3D space with a haptic, with no constraining of anything, right? And I can do that here. I can just come in and I can just draw these curves and create these curves in 3D space. Now, when I am done creating those, I can just come over to my CAD palette, because you'll notice I have a lot of different a lot of different tools over here, whether I'm working with voxels, uh, sub-Ds, CAD objects. And I can just say, I want to create a CAD surface patch. So I just created a CAD surface patch from those curves in space. But you'll see, it doesn't really intersect where I want it to. And again, this is where the haptic comes in handy. I can click on these curves and I can just grab and move them around in space, just visually. And I'm just using my other view as a guide to see where I move it. And I can just massage that surface to go wherever I want it to go in space. So if I just click over here, I manipulate that around, you can see how I could get to the point where I want. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just use the one that I created before, cause I'm starting to run out of time and I wanna show one more workflow, is I'll turn that surface patch off and I'll turn this one on cause I, I massage that one to get into the location that I wanted to. Turn those other curves off. And I'll just use this split tool, it's called separate. So I can, come in and I can say I want to separate this object with a CAD surface and then I just touch the object that I want to separate 
and then hit apply. Do it one more time here. Touch it. And then you'll see it separates the object into two. So I'll turn my CAD surface off. You'll see one is grayed out because it's the non-active shape. So I was able to divide that into two pieces and I can just hide one or the other. Then uh, another popular thing to do while I'm in here before I switch over is I can actually stamp a texture on top of the surface. So if I wanted to put our company logo on here, I can just put our logo on here. We just adjust that, come in, touch it, and then I will just select how far I want it to offset, and I can say inner outer, and it will offset and put the logo on there. Now, if I raise the resolution of the object, it'll uh, raise the resolution of the logo that I stamped in there. So that is the uh, uh, brace workflow. Uh, what I'm going to do with the last few minutes here of my time is jump over to uh, sub D workflow and just show how you can model with sub Ds in here. And then we'll go to a, a q and A. I'll try to go a little quicker in here just to kind of show the concept. Um, but the idea is here is a scan of another hand and with sub Ds, you can do highly organic modeling inside of a 3D space. Now, subdivisional surfaces have been utilized in the animation and in that whole world and the film industry for a long time. Um, and what they are is a different type of uh, essentially a combination. It reminds me of a combination of a NURB surface with a polygon shape around the outside that allows you to sculpt. and it's not sculpt as in the term that we did with voxels, but you can actually create these free flowing shapes very easily in here. So you see you have this puppet cage around the outside. The orange is the actual geometry itself. And what you can do is you can manipulate this cage by dragging and creating organic shapes. Um, so if I turn the hand off real quick, I can grab and move and essentially grab corners, edges, or even faces to create different shapes that I'm looking to create. Now, another aspect of this is you can also adjust the crease value as well. So a crease value, if I select this, is you can pull attention to the edge. So you can see this here. So if I grab all four of these sides and just create creases there. So if I want to create a nice sharp edge to that side, and then I want to, let's say that I just want to move this down here. So if I was going to create a mouse for this hand, and I can, again, utilize a real 3D scan of that person's anatomy, I can use the hand as a guide for scale and a sense of ergonomics. And you have a bunch of different tools in here, not just to drag all the independent faces around, but you can subdivide. So if I wanted to add more resolution, then toggle back over to move again and drag just on that point. And the reason why they're called subdivisional surfaces is you can actually subdivide the surface and the cage. Um, so if I, if my surface resolution isn't high enough here, I can actually jump it up and I can raise the resolution higher and higher. So if I can go to a level nine and you see how super sharp uh, that surface is and how, how clean it is. Now, the interesting thing is they're multi-resolutional. So if I want to keep working, I can drop right back to that pixelated level three and keep modeling keep making changes. And then when I'm done, I can jack it all the way back up to the level eight and you'll see that it is, it is smooth again. Now the key to these subdivisional surfaces, and this is where the real payoff is for these, is whatever I create with these tools that are a little bit uh, foreign to use, um, 
is that they turn into CAD seamlessly. So if I can come over here to subdivisional surfaces, I say copy to. Obviously, I can convert them to clay and meshes. That's really easy to do. But I can also say I want to convert this to a CAD object. So now this is actually a, a NURBS CAD object that I could save out as a step I just sat neutral file format, right? Um, so this is a workflow where um, I would spend some time and I could sculpt the shape using the sub D surfaces. I can even combine that with voxels with meshes like I did with the hand and then create a consumer product in here that has an ergonomic shape that's manufacturable inside of Freeform. Go ahead and turn this back over to uh, Ian and Matt. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. All right, well, we are out of time, uh, but that was awesome, very eye-opening for those of us coming from traditional CAD backgrounds. A big thanks to our guest, Gregory George, and a big thanks to everyone who joined today. So uh, thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.